What's up, everybody? I'm Katie. And I'm Morgan. And this is For Your Misinformation, a podcast dedicated to empowering women to become more politically engaged so we can act in our own best interests. Let us identify the problem and tell you what we're doing and what you can do to help solve it. Hi, Morgan. Hi, Katie. How are you doing this week? You know, I'm okay. Yeah, same. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. That's really all I can say. Yeah, it's been probably like a week and a half since we talked, and so much has happened so quickly. Yeah, so many things. Super Tuesday happened since the last time we talked, and yeah. I just have so many different emotions about all of that that like I'm just not quite sure I'm ready to like fully even verbalize all of this yet same um yeah I'm sure I will think about it some more like later this week but um so we're recording this on Thursday March 5th which is coincidentally the day that Elizabeth Warren dropped out of the presidential race and I think we're both Kind of like frustrated and sad and disappointed and grieving. Yeah. Yeah. Grieving is a great way to put it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to get myself like a really nice bottle of wine yeah. from a female owned vineyard <laughs> and deal with my feelings probably tomorrow. Yeah. I decided to take today to grieve. So we kind of knew. I don't know. I've had a feeling for a while that this was like the inevitable conclusion and that but like especially after all the moderates consolidated behind Joe Biden, it was like, oh, this is really like the only like logical path. So like Mm -hmm. I wasn't like surprised this morning when I saw that she was suspending her campaign, but I definitely like went to my go to feel better thing, which is to order a number nine from McDonald's and ate my feelings. Um, but so I'm taking today to grieve and then tomorrow. Um, I don't know. Excited to get to work for Bernie Sanders. So, yeah, exactly. There's always more to do. I think that like something after Super Tuesday that, you know, we, I already knew existed, but I feel just really called to try to tackle over these next weeks um, leading up to the November election is voter suppression and looking at like what I can do about that because it limited a lot of people on Super Tuesday and this is that's for a primary like this should not be happening yeah and uh, yeah so I think that after after I you know eat my feelings and peanut butter toast yeah um, that that that's where I'm gonna head and that's that's a good point too and like something that I want to bring up is um there was a lot of news reports about really 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 long lines for voting especially in California and Texas especially in minority neighborhoods and that in itself is a form of voter suppression so just when you hear about um people needing to take like three five seven hours to vote like that's an attempt to minimize their voices and like don't I don't know. Don't interpret that as anything else. Like that is a form of voter suppression. Yeah, exactly. So future um, future episode on that definitely coming your way, listeners. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, okay. Well, this week we decided that we wanted to talk about coronavirus woo, woo. and uh, the Trump administration's response to it or lack of, I don't know. I mean, how does it how do you feel knowing that either one of us would be better prepared to handle this uh, coronavirus pandemic than like anybody else that has been put on that task force? Yeah, I feel on the one hand, like really proud of us, like, hey, we are better experts (laughs) than the coronavirus task force Mm -hmm. in Washington, but also really angry about that same thing. Yeah. (laughs) Again. So many mixed feelings. It is so frustrating to watch as somebody who like, so I think a lot of people probably don't realize this, but like your local health department has a big response in um, emergency or big role to play in emergency response. And you and I were both part of that uh, response in where our old place of work. Um, and my role was as public information officer. So I had to take lots and lots of training on messaging around um, emergency responses, whether it be like 
um, natural disasters or pandemics or whatever. There's just the, the, uh, the government's response to it is so important. And it was just, I probably gone to like 80 plus hours of training just about that. And it is so frustrating and like scary to watch Donald Trump like ramble about how it's probably going to go away in April when the warmer weather comes back. And like, it's just, that is not true. There's no information, like there's no data to suggest that that is going to happen. And it's just like, when you are responding to an emergency that's like as important as this, like it is really important to get out correct information really quickly. And our government is doing none of that. And it's just frustrating and scary. Yeah, it is. And like, yeah, just say what you don't know, which truthfully is a lot. Like there is a lot that we don't know. And it's better to admit that than to do what Trump is doing, which is appoint people who are, not in a good position to handle it and just ramble on false numbers and literally just spewing complete nonsense because one, and he doesn't can't, know anything, including how to put together sure. like, but words. you can't even yeah. like, you cannot estimate percentages like mortality until after it's over. So all of the people who are like, I mean, you can do your best to give guesses, but they're throwing out numbers like, Three percent mortality rate, one point something percent more. I mean, I I think the most credible guess that we yeah. have right now is probably about a two percent mortality rate. But like like you said, Trump is trying to minimize it, trying to downplay it because of the role it's going to have on the stock market and da 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 da. And it's just it's dangerous. And yeah, because it could have a two percent mortality. It could have a six percent mortality, which is actually what I heard earlier was like the most recent. Um, guess, but again, it's a guess because you can only measure the mortality right. based on the number of cases that you have. And we don't really know the incidence of this. It's too new. And, and in the United States, right. there haven't been enough tests. There haven't been enough available. There haven't been enough people tested. So they don't know how many people have actually had this. And, you know, not to mention the tests, even if they did have enough, are not accessible. And, you know, they don't even know enough about this virus at this point to know, Mm -hmm. you know, okay, so a young, healthy person like you or I might just think we have a cold. Um, And so, you know, maybe we don't get tested or go in or, you know, really even end up being one of those statistics. And like, there's just not enough that they know at this point. They still don't even know if there's more than one strain of this particular uh, coronavirus or COVID-19, like they still don't even know yeah. that there might be two strains, um, the zoonotic and the uh, like, um, yeah. community spread might be totally yeah. different. We just don't know yet. And misinformation yeah. is only going to make things worse. Like not knowing is, is bad knowing or thinking, you know, yeah. but having what, you know, be totally wrong. So let's, is worse. let's empower people with information. Um, Let's give like a little bit of a history. Mm-hmm. So from to, you know, public health professionals, um, coronaviruses are not new. Um, almost assuredly, if you are listening to this podcast, you're a person in the world. You've probably contracted a coronavirus at one point in your life or another. Um, but usually the symptoms are mild. This new outbreak is related to SARS and MERS. I don't know if you guys rem- remember... Um, SARS and MERS, but they are both coronaviruses also, which are a large group of RNA viruses that have been circulating around humans and many species of animals for a long, long time. Um, Generally, they cause varying degrees of gastrointestinal distress and respiratory illness, like upper respiratory illnesses. But this novel coronavirus or COVID-19 is is a little bit different and it's it's more serious. Um, it is not like the common flu, even though Trump keeps trying to uh, compare it to the common flu. It is not. Yes. Influenza and coronavirus are very different. You've probably had them both, a coronavirus and a strain of the flu, but influenza and coronaviruses are not yes. the same, not the same right. virus. Um, so let's talk about this novel coronavirus. Um, 
unlikely to wipe out the human race, though vulnerable populations like older adults and kids and people with compromised immune systems should really take precautions. Um, They're not really sure how it spilled over into humans, but it's likely bats is that what I don't know. Some of the other coronaviruses that have got, gotten into humans have been from camels. Um, there's, I don't know. I'm sure we'll fi- find out eventually, but it's hard to know this uh, this early in the outbreak. Um, but yeah, it is different from the other coronaviruses that circulate because this one impacts the lower respiratory system, which is more dangerous. And like we talked about earlier, we do not yet know what the transmission rate or mortality rates are because we're in the early stages of this disease. Um, But we can kind of extrapolate a lot of data from SARS and MERS because they act similarly. This one is transmitted via droplets, just like other coronaviruses. It's not really sure. We're not really sure how long it can live on surfaces, but probably a few hours. Um, But yeah, we won't be able to estimate a case fatality rate until after the outbreak is over. Also, based on some other reporting that I've seen, most of this information is from the This Podcast Will Kill You episode about the novel coronavirus, but also from the CDC and the World Health Organization. So it's likely that there are more low-level illnesses than with SARS, like that California resident that contracted the disease without knowingly encountering an individual with the virus. Um, That kind of tells us that there are people carrying the virus in the United States who don't even really know that they have it through that community spread. And I know that sounds scary, but it is actually good news because it means that there are people out there who already have it who only have low-level symptoms. So it, um, like you said earlier, like healthy and youngish individuals like you and me like probably don't have much to worry about. But we are not the ones that we should be concerned about. It's us spreading it to people who are at risk. That is like what the real fear should be. So if you have it, if you feel sick, stay home, right? Yes. Stay home if you feel sick. If you are like a supervisor or a boss or a person in power, like be flexible with your employees. If somebody says that they're feeling kind of sick or if one of their kids is sick or their kid's school shuts down or whatever... Like, allow them to work from home if, if yes. they can. Like, don't get angry. Like, this is just a thing that we're going to probably be dealing with for a little while. Like, people are yes. going to have to stay home or they should stay home. Yeah, have some perspective. It's better for everybody when people who are sick stay at home. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, a few other things you can do are really just things that you either should be doing anyway, like mm-hmm. washing your hands. Wash your hands <laughs> and uh, just being sensible, you know, cover your cough. Don't cover your cough with your hands. Like, right. You know, Use your elbow. Your elbow, those kinds Clean of things. your cell phone. Yeah. Cell phones are so gross. Seriously. Clean under your fingernails. Wash your hands for sing happy birthday twice. What is that right? I should yeah. know. Yeah. Okay, and, good. <laughs> and happy birthday twice. Wash your hands with soap. If you mm-hmm. can't wash your hands with soap, use hand sanitizer. Mm-hmm. It actually works, despite what somebody on Twitter told you. Um, you, unless you're a healthcare provider or a person who is actively ill with some kind of respiratory thing, you don't need to wear a mask. Um, those are are not really for you. Um, yeah, and you know maybe it's not a bad idea to stock up on something. Don't like raid your local Walgreens or your Costco. Mm-hmm. But you know if you are sick, you can't stay home if you have no tissues and toilet paper and food. Um, so you know, like stock up on a few things so that if you do decide that you should self quarantine, mm-hmm. you can do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. Um... Do you want to talk about some of the other maybe misinformation that we've heard? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, So one really big thing we've got to quash is that the coronavirus COVID-19 is some kind of like germ warfare Mm -hmm. that China was working on in a lab. Um, we are not here to entertain those kinds of conspiracies because that's not how this went down. They know that this came from some kind of zoonotic, uh, probably bats, um, but that's that's where it originated. And 
like also if if China was like, yeah, we're going to create a virus and it's going to be used to kill people in America, mm-hmm. they wouldn't have released it to their own people first. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would be way worse. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> there wouldn't, if, if they had designed the perfect like germ, they wouldn't use a coronavirus. I'd just do smallpox. They would use, if it yeah, were up they to would me. use something way different, like smallpox. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like they would use something way different if they were trying to do that. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not like we absolutely know that this is not something like that. Um, people like Steve Bannon just want people to think that like this is some kind of crazy conspiracy because they, they being Trump and his whole administration yeah. are afraid of China. They hate China. They don't like Chinese people and they love to perpetuate racism. Right. Um, speaking of racism, so once if- again, I'm sorry, I, I know the point you're about to make and it's really important, but I just want to interject this and I know we highlight this all the time, but be cognizant of people who are trying to make you act out of like fear um, yes. and like sow that division and sow that division and stuff like that because they are trying to get you to act out of fear instead of out of like your values and logic and things like that. They're trying to get you like out of that part of your brain that thinks logically and into that one that thinks the part of your brain that thinks that acts out of like, I don't know, preserving your own best interests. But um, you have to think about things logically. So whenever you hear people um, and Trump does this all the time and his whole administration does this all the time, but whenever they try to get you to act out of fear, just um, like take a beat and think to yourself like okay what is what are they trying to get me to feel and like what is probably the truth behind it so yeah. I don't know that's a exactly. good for your misinformation rule is just be aware of when people are trying to get you to act out of fear well yeah and that's kind of like how part of his whole thing he is afraid of getting or not getting reelected mm-hmm. and it's a lot easier if he can just gaslight people and have yeah. people be afraid than it is to actually like do his job. Yeah, um, because he and- is only not in prison because he's the president. If yeah. like as soon as he is no longer the president, he can be indicted for the crimes that he was impeached for, and among many many others. Um, but like that's the only thing keeping him out of prison is being in office. So he's going to act like ruthlessly to stay in office. Yep. Um. Anyway, yeah, so going back to racism, right? <laughs> if you see it, shut it down. If you see people being weird about anyone Chinese or even just Asian in general, like mm-hmm. I, somebody that was like Cambodian was said that people were like yelling at them on a subway. And he's like, mm-hmm. dude, I have like never lived outside of like New Jersey. Calm yeah. down. Like some so, profiling going yeah, on. Yeah, like shut it down. Like, Support your local Chinese restaurants because apparently yes. people have stopped going to them, which is yes. so unnecessary. Right. This is like, don't, and like, if people are calling this like the Chinese virus, we're, correct them. Tell them, no, mm-hmm. no, this is COVID-19. It's one of seven strains of coronavirus. Mm-hmm. Like, it corrects that kind of misinformation because we can't have those kinds of ideas floating around. That's the kind of thing that the whole Trump crime syndicate like thrives on. Right. Um, so don't allow it. Um, also, yeah, like it, this is going to have economic impact. It, it is. And it already has, right? We've mm-hmm. seen the stock market. We've seen the effects there. Um, and chances are we were heading to a recession anyway. This is probably just going to speed that up. But also, like, don't be one of those people who is fooled into thinking that when a stock market is doing really well or really poorly, that that's even indicative of how the president is doing. When the stock market's doing well, Trump likes to brag, like, that has something to do with him and that, like, that means he's a good leader and... And it inspires people to be like, yeah, my 401k is great. Trump 2020. No, right. like that one, like this, like the stock market doing well up until now really didn't have anything to do with Trump. That was years yeah, before he even took office. Been trending for like a decade that way. Yeah. And two, like just because we saw this in a tweet uh, and there were other people that were like, oh, hey, me too. 
people and their, like, their family members and friends are like, oh, well, my 401k has been doing well. I think I'm going to vote for Trump in November. Literally, that is a terrible reason to vote for anyone. Yeah. Um, do not be involved <laughs> into that either. It's just um, one measure of the health of the economy, and it's not by any means like the most important one or the one that like affects your life the most. Or as, if you're like a normal, regular person, unless, yeah. unless you're a person who has tons of money in the stock stock market, um, it's just like not a great indicator for you. Yeah, and like these are just so many things that I like really wish I didn't have to say in 2020, right? Like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, like, oh, hey, the stock market doesn't mean you should vote for your president. And um, coronavirus has nothing to do with someone being Chinese. And mm -hmm. like, I just, ah, it makes me so just like, angry and sad that these are the kinds of conversations we even still have to be having at this point. Yeah. But yeah, like, there's just so much out there. Um you know, and another thing I want to kind of circle back to related to the whole conspiracy thing is when people are like, yeah, well, China lied about the coronavirus and they tried to hide it and they mm -hmm. haven't been truthful because it's a, uh, they're communists and it's an autocracy yeah. and all that. Okay. The U.S. is doing the same thing. Like Donald yeah. Trump and his administration are doing the same thing. Um, they're autocrats. I, That's what they yeah. want. Like, I think a lot of that comes from um, the Chinese officials' um, reaction to SARS. So mm -hmm. they were um, they kept that information really close to their chest for a long time and did not share it. Um, and obviously, uh, especially in the case of a pandemic, like you want information, you want people to be very transparent and have the free and open exchange of information because that helps. I mean, it just, it just helps, um, in a response to a pandemic. Um, but the Chinese government has been much better and more transparent this time around with the COVID-19 response, probably more so than what we have, the Americans have been doing. And yeah. that is, we should be embarrassed by that. <laughs> like, Oh, I don't know. It, yeah. I just wanted to give some like context, like for why people were worried about China's response to it. Um, but this time around, China has been very transparent and had um, open sharing of information. And that like has allowed us to have a better reaction to it. Like we had like the genome sequence or whatever of the virus, like within a couple weeks of um, like the first reports of it, which is like amazing. Um yeah, but, I mean, they're able to work on a vaccine right now. Right. And vaccines take like a year and a half before they're actually on the market. But if this particular, you know, novel coronavirus, COVID-19, ends up being like the seasonal flu and it's just something that we end up living with for a while, um, it's going to be really great to have that vaccine. And the, mm -hmm. like they've been able to move on it pretty fast. And that's yeah. good. That's a good thing. I mean... Hopefully it doesn't come to that where it's like a seasonal flu, just like a really bad seasonal flu that kills all the yeah. old people. But if, if it comes to that, I mean, I'm glad that we have science. Science yeah. is good. We love yeah. science on um, <laughs> this podcast. We, we love we it. We do. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, um, our The Trump administration's response to the COVID-19 outbreak has been something that you would probably expect to see in like more of an authoritarian regime because they are less interested mm -hmm. in um, sharing the truth than they are in like making and downplaying it basically. So yeah, so make sure that you're getting your information from legitimate sources like the World Health Organization, the CDC, but probably you're wa going to want to like look to your local health departments also. Yeah, local health departments are awesome. Um, find out if you have like a medical reserve core yeah. in your community. Those are the people that are working super, super freaking hard to make sure that they are ready for emergencies. And the people that are behind those are passionate and really motivated and they're very good at what they do. So you, you can trust those people. Um, don't always trust the talking heads yeah. that are part of Trump's COVID-19 task force. Um, like Steve Miller's wife, if you remember, we talked about Steve Miller as like one of the Kevin fans. Um, yeah, his wife like yelled at a reporter for asking a very valid question mm -hmm. during a press briefing, which is the point of a press right. briefing. So like, 
I don't know why she's even there, but yeah, there's that. Um, and then Mike Pence, um, our vice president. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. Um, yeah, he is, he is one of the only people on the task force with public health experience. Unfortunately, his public health experience is failure yeah. and dismantling public health in the state of Indiana where he was a governor. Yes. Um, yeah, like his response or his lack of response mm-hmm. is just mishandling. Oof, that's, that's the yeah. word right there. Mishandling. His mishandling of a very small um, HIV outbreak ended up turning into a very large HIV mm-hmm. outbreak. I'm and, sure he prayed uh, about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Um, that's, you know, probably... I don't know. I don't even know if we can say that he probably did that yeah. much. Honestly, he probably didn't even care. Uh, yeah, like it's just he's not the kind of person that we should have in charge of anything public health related. Yeah. Clearly, so I what mean, hap- he destroyed a lot of the things in Indiana, yeah. but like, oof. So what what happened with the HIV outbreak in Indiana is that there was a small one, and that um, like evidence based programs showed that a clean needle exchange program would reduce rates of HIV transmission. And he didn't believe in that, right? He didn't. He doesn't really believe in like risk reduction, harm reduction, and right. He doesn't believe in that, and apparently just like decided that the evidence was, I don't know, too sciencey. Yeah. So that's just that's just what happens when you, um, yeah, when you mishandle a uh, a public health crisis like that, and you don't listen to the science behind it and the evidence based. Um, recommendations of experts, um, which unfortunately is kind of what we're seeing again because Mike Pence has been put yeah. in uh, in charge of the coronavirus response. He's probably one of those people who does not wash their hands because he's like, well, it says antibacterial soap and this is a virus, so it's not going to help. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like he's probably one of those people. Yeah, let's squ- squash that right now. Um Washing your hands is an incredibly effective way, especially with um, this particular virus. So please, 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 please wash your hands. Wash your hands. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, wash your hands. Um, There is one person that I do want to talk about. Yes. um, That we can trust Mm -hmm. in Washington. He might be the only person right now we can trust in Washington Mm -hmm. as it relates particularly to COVID-19. So Dr. Anthony Fauci, he is... He's awesome. Um, Hopefully he isn't fired because, as we know, Trump likes to fire people Mm -hmm. who are doing their jobs well. And oppose him, which is another mark of authoritarian regimes. Uh Uh-huh. So, yeah. So, um, Dr. Fauci is one of or probably the um, top infectious disease expert in this country. um, And he has been for decades. Um, He really is like one of the people that is responsible for the HIV AIDS crisis finally no longer being a crisis. Obviously it's still a public health problem. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, and it's still something he's so devoted Mm -hmm. to working on. Like this guy, this guy is awesome. Um, And yet for some reason, despite the fact that he is wonderful and seriously, like you can listen to him, people. Um, the talking heads on this whole thing have been like Mike Pence and the Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar, who like the best thing I can say about him is that he's okay. Yeah. Like that's the nicest thing I can say about him. Um, he's Azar is not a doctor. Like he's the Secretary of Health and Human Services, but he's not a doctor. He's a pharmaceutical lobbyist. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess okay, yeah, he should be on the task force but he shouldn't be leading it he shouldn't be the voice that we're hearing i don't know yeah. i mean i i do know but i <laughs> yeah so um yeah anyway the gold star of the week if we're giving out gold stars sure. is to dr anthony fauci because he's awesome yeah. so yeah he's a person that we can go to for legitimate factual information um do you know if he has like social media I was just going to say, I don't know. He's like 79. <laughs> so um, that doesn't mean he doesn't. I'm not trying to be ageist. I'm yeah. just saying if he does, it might be somebody else that leads it. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, like some older people are super woke yeah. on Twitter and stuff. Like, I'm, you know, you don't know. But 
Um, he also does so many different things. I don't know how he would have enough time for Twitter yeah. or, you know, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to, going to have to check that out. I'm going to check it out right now. Okay. Okay. You do that. I'm going to give a public health PSA. Um, oh, yeah. which is just that public health and politics are like inextric- inextricably linked. Um, whether it's seat belts or like clean air and water or lead poisoning in children or whatever, um, most of the positive um, impacts we've seen on life expectancy in the last like 100 years or more than that even um, have been a result of like public health victories, including like vaccines and stuff like that. So um, it's really important that your elected officials, who are the ones who are determining funding priorities, understand um, the importance of public health and that their values align with yours. Um, emerging infectious disease is only going to be a bigger deal in the future. Um, so it's really important that we increase funding for that and not decrease funding for it. Um, more resources should be channeled into early detection and surveillance in humans and wildlife. So make sure that you're electing people who give a shit about public health um, because this is the kind of situation where you're hoping that people who are competent are in charge and, um, yeah, just understand the value of, like, science and evidence-based practices um and a reminder that mike pence called climate change a myth so i'm not not feeling super optimistic about him being in charge of this but um but yeah i think as long as like we realize that and and, uh act accordingly and you know get our own information from uh reputable sources then i think we'll be okay amen (laughs) did you find anything does he have social media I didn't find it. That's a bummer. Oh, well. Um, Yeah. I mean, I didn't expect much. But what I did find was um, Bailey, uh, Elizabeth Warren's dog, Bailey, mm -hmm. um, stole somebody's burrito. Oh, I saw that too. Which is just like, hey, me too. I too am eating my Mm -hmm. feelings. And as also the owner of a golden retriever, I'm like, yep. Yeah. This is accurate. I'm watching people try to get the burrito out of his mouth and they get to do this every day. And yeah, like we should let Bailey eat his feelings, but also like as the owner of a golden retriever, um, if Bailey eats that burrito, then Elizabeth Warren is going to be subjected to the worst dog. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I understand why they at least want to like try to get it away, yeah. but also like good dog. Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll let it. Bailey, Bailey 2024. Yeah, I wish. Um, okay, what else did we want to talk about? Um, well, we could have our little yay of the week. Yeah, I think we might have gotten to everything that we wanted to talk about. I guess, let's see. Um, yeah, okay. Don't freak out. Don't believe information without sources. Humans have gotten really good at controlling infectious diseases and understanding how they're transmitted and protecting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, Realize that this isn't the last outbreak we're going to experience, that a lot has already happened during this pandemic that we can use to better control the next one. Um, So, yeah, so don't freak out, but still take some, um, you know, preventative measures. Don't use this as an excuse to be xenophobic. Remember that travel bans are usually ineffective and mostly just ways to spread xenophobia and racism. Um, And if you find yourself thinking about this and worrying about this a lot, um, make sure that you are getting your flu vaccine because that is a bigger risk to you than the coronavirus is, this novel coronavirus. Um, And remember that herd immunity matters and that it's really important that you get your flu shot. And yeah, that's something that you should be more worried about than the actual coronavirus. So there, that's my that's yep. my last bit of coronavirus information, I think. Yes. And ditto all of okay. it. Okay, good. Okay, well, so what have you done um, 
to make yourself less anxious about the state of our democracy this week? Well, um, uh, one of the things that I did that I decided was like kind of a me thing, mm-hmm. but a me thing that also was going to give back to the world that we live in, which is slowly but surely getting warmer, mm-hmm. is that I signed up to volunteer with my local um, conservation oh, nice. agency. And like, again, it's kind of that whole thing where like, it's a nice little intersection of political issues and also like just like life Mm -hmm. um how like public health and politics are inextricably linked Mm -hmm. um the public health includes a lot of climate things and um so i'm just sitting here like i want to do something to help stop climate change besides recycling and you know like these kinds of things and I was like, oh my gosh, why don't I volunteer for my local conservation agency? So I just signed up to do that and I'm so excited oh, about that's it. Nice. And it yeah, so that makes me feel really good. Um yeah, and then uh also just kind of having my little happy dance about the fact that Chris Matthews is retiring. Oh, yeah, I <laughs> that also makes me feel good. Ah. I have always hated watching his segments. And but I never really like thought too much about it. And then um, like really just recently was like seeing some more clips of like him just speaking over female uh, guests on his show and like really reducing them to objects and just talking about like how attractive they are or unattractive, you know, as if that's like all that they have to offer. And oh, my God, I hate him so much. Like I I'm almost glad that I like was sort of like blissfully unaware of his existence, but yeah, I like just became aware of him, was really pissed off about it, and then he resigned. And I'm so glad. Yeah. Um, I was so happy because he is gross. He is like a gross, like pervy, objectifying, icky man. And, and that is the uh, lens through which a lot of us receive our news. And he was an anchor on MSNBC, pretty much like the most liberal uh station that you can view news on you know and like so it's just it's really pervasive and it's like oh no wonder elizabeth warren didn't thrive in this community like you this society where like we put incredibly misogynistic men in charge of like filtering our news for us which is like part of the reason that we started this podcast you know is like i would rather hear news like filtered through a woman's perspective because so much of it gets filtered through a men's perspective and i'm just I'm not interested in that anymore. Like, it did not get us to a point that I'm enjoying. So I'd rather hear a few women's perspectives for now. Please and thank you. I'm just, well, yeah, exactly. Like, media is so bad about being diverse. Mm -hmm. And so anytime an old white guy gets off the air, I celebrate a little bit, especially if he's really gross. And, Chris Matthews definitely is. And I just really, really hope that he will be replaced by a female and or a person of yeah. color, um, you know, like, um, or some, you know, and when I say female, I mean, like, identifying as female mm-hmm. or identifying as a woman. Um, you know, there's also very little representation of the, like, LGBT community, especially trans people sure. in the media. And I think that also needs to change. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a good, that's a good hooray. Um, mm-hmm. I uh, found, well, yeah, I guess, found a really, really um, great newsletter. I've signed up for a bajillion newsletters, but this one is like very refreshing. Um, it's Lauren Duca's newsletter and it's called Pancake Brain. Um, and it usually goes out every Friday. Um, but It's just, it like unscrambled my thoughts about Elizabeth Warren today and kind of like verbalized them and then also made me like feel optimistic about the future. So if you want like, I don't know, a nice like way to like unfuck your brain is kind of how she puts it um, that like arrives straight into your inbox. Um, I really like that one. Um, I am also, so in Illinois, I know I've talked about this before, the um, Illinois primary is on March 17th. Um, 
I will be checking out my sample ballot for my district on Vote Save America um, because I want to make sure, um, you know, that I am voting in my own best interest and I want to make sure that I um, have all the information that I need. Um, so especially judges, it's really good to, I don't know, maybe I'll talk more about this next week. Um, but yeah, so look at a sample ballot, see, figure out what it is. And then remember that you can like print that off and bring that with you. You don't have to like memorize anything. There's no rule against bringing stuff with you to vote. Like feel free to bring that with you. You did your homework. Good job. You can bring it with you. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about that swing left postcard writing party that I went to for Marie Newman. It was really yeah. nice. Like I little old introverted me, um, went to the library, uh, on a Tuesday night and there were probably about 20 women, like our parents age there. Um, no surprise, at least to me that it was all women that were <laughs> working to yeah. save democracy and elect an actual mm -hmm. de Democrat in Illinois third district, but we were writing postcards to democratic voters in Illinois third district, asking them to turn out for Marie Newman on March 17th. Um, and it was really cute. And some of them even said that they would start listening to this. So if you are, hello, hello. friends now. Um, but yeah, they were like, what are the youths thinking? And I was <laughs> like, uh, I don't know if I speak for all the youths, but uh, I really like Elizabeth Warren and all of my friends um, either like her uh, or are really excited about Bernie Sanders. And they seem to be uh, kind of surprised by that. But um yeah, I don't know. It it was it was fun and it was it felt nice to get out there. I probably wrote um like 20 postcards in 2 hours cuz there was a lot of like chit chat. We also had turned the debate on, so it was like kind of fun to watch the debate. Mm -hmm. And it's so weird to think that that was only like 9 days ago because that field was like huge then, or at least it felt like it and now it's like literally down to wow. two people. Oh, although Tulsi's technically still in it, but I mean, it's just so much has happened. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so that was fun, and it felt good to go get out and do something and like talk to like-minded people. It was it was nice. So it felt made me feel a little bit less anxious. Like there's actually there's people out there doing doing work and feels good. And I can be one of those people. We can be one of those people. So I found that event um, at Swing Left's uh, website. I put in my little. Um, zip code and then it tells me what kind of events are going on near me and I figured one, figured out one that worked with my schedule and went off to it and it was very fun. That's so cool. Yeah, I'm glad. Um, do you have a self-care corner? <laughs> like what are you doing to make yourself feel less anxious not in a political way just in like a taking care of yourself way? Just in like my general like life way yeah. okay i have been watching the show Shit's creek on netflix oh, yeah. like it's my job and i just oh like so yesterday i was really feeling sad because i saw a cartoon on twitter that made me very sad because it was about a dog <laughs> and okay. so i started crying and i couldn't stop and i turned on Shit's creek and watched like four episodes and just like within three seconds mm -hmm. of Dan Levy's happy little face. Mm -hmm. Ew, David. So I was like, ah, oh, and I just felt so much better. Yeah. Um, so that's just like my like little thing that I'm doing that I just felt feel better about. And also I bought myself two new bras. Nice. And if that is not self-care, then I don't know what Underwire or no? They're hella comfortable. No. There you go. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to get everybody on board with this. I have not worn a bra with an underwire in months, and I'm all about it. I'm never going back. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, my life is forever changed. Yes, good. Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. So comfortable. Worth the investment. Yes. People with boobs, get yourselves some underwire free bras because holy crap. Oh, because I could sleep in it. Literally could sleep in it. Bras with underwires are definitely a product of the patriarchy <laughs> yeah for sure yeah um well i went to both physical therapy and therapy therapy in the last week so i'm feeling like pretty physically and mentally good 
God, that's so much therapy. I, I love it. My back feels good. I feel good. Um, and yeah, so everything everything else is pretty good too. And I just got back from California. I visited my oldest friend um, who I grew up down the street from and it was very, very nice. We went whale watching and we saw two super active humpback whales and I just feel like really good. So I didn't, I, I did a lot of like resting and recharging and taking pretty good care of myself this week. And then the day I got back from California, actually the next day on Super Tuesday, my foster cat had nine kittens. It's so many. It's arguably too many. Um, It has been stressing me out because I want to make sure they're all getting enough food and there's only eight nipples. Like it's a little bit stressful. But oh my God, now I understand why she was so big. She had nine fucking cats. So I spent literally all of Super Tuesday just being a cat midwife. Like I went down there at like noon and there was a little tail sticking out of her. And I was like, oh God, it's time. It's happening. And freaked out and called the vet. And they were like, yeah, it'll be, it'll be fine. And they were right. It was like not that bad. I just... I don't know. I was very stressed out for the whole day. It literally took probably like 12 hours for all nine of them to be born because it was I was up. I was up really late. Um, But oh, my God, they're so cute. There's basically like three white ones with spots, three gray ones and three black ones. Basically, I love them. I know they're so cute. I want a kitten. I was, so I actually slept in with them last night. Like I slept down in that room with them because they're so little that when they're nursing, they get like suctioned onto the nipple. And then when she gets up to eat or go to the bathroom, she like drags them with her for a while. So she was just like (laughs) depositing them around the room like, and then not picking them back up and bringing them back to the nest so i like (laughs) she's i don't know she's not good at that and it was like really stressing me out so i had to like so anyway i slept down there and then at like six in the morning i was like oh maybe if i just turn this box around so that there's not like an opening that they can be dragged out of so instead she has to like walk over a wall of cardboard they'll like get scraped off on the wall and they'll stay in the little nest that they have and it works so now they're not getting like dragged and deposited around the room and i don't have to like sleep in the basement and make sure that they're all like together so yeah so that feels good too, but it was it was very stressful. I had to cut some umbilical cords with floss. I felt, yeah, Ooh. I'm definitely putting cat midwife on my resume now. Uh, yeah, you for sure should. Yeah. So I'll have them for probably like three more months until they get are old enough to get adopted. Maybe like ten weeks. I mean, I will definitely be visiting yep. them at least once. Great. No promises that I won't. Like adopt. So yeah, would we even notice? Probably not. There are so many. True. Yeah, the vet was this like, "I'm so sorry, we haven't had a litter of nine in years," and I was like, "It's okay, <laughs> you didn't know." And like, it's not like my landlord is even gonna notice if I get another cat. Yeah. They don't know. Yeah. So I don't know. Think about it. Baby cats. Also, like when you said nine, my first thought was like, "Oh my gosh." We could name them after Supreme Court. I thought that too. <laughs> or planet. Supreme Court like stuff. I know. We don't want to name them after yep. that. So I do like planet. Yeah. I I'm I'm thinking about maybe not naming them and trying to like not get super attached, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, it's hard not to get attached, yeah. but like how do you not get kind of I attached? Know. I delivered them. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, how do OB nurses do it? Because seriously, like, they probably get attached to everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, so that was my, that's my good news for the week. That's my, like, self-care corner and stuff. Literally the greatest thing ever. And if you need any, like, kitten milk replacer <laughs> or any of that stuff, you let me know. Okay. I'll make a donation. Thank you. 
Um, oh, and speaking of donations, um, that's another thing that I want to make sure that I do tomorrow is I have been making, um, I just set up like a recurring monthly donation to Elizabeth Warren's campaign. And now that she dropped out today, I will promptly tomorrow be switching that over to be a monthly recurring donation to Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, I want to make a point like not to trash talk Joe Biden. Um, I understand why people support him. I just uh, prefer Bernie's vision for the country. And I think that um, he has like a much more inclusive way of talking about it and understanding it. And so I, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to get to work for him. And one of the <laughs> easiest ways and like most reliable ways of doing that is donating to a campaign. And they especially appreciate it if it's a monthly recurring donation, even if it's just a couple dollars, because they then know that they can like count on that money and then they can help. It helps them plan. So mm -hmm. that's just why I chose to do that um, instead of like a one time donation. Um, all right. Anything else or should I should I read uh, an iTunes review? I think it's time for an iTunes review. Okay, awesome. Um, this one says it's from R.I. Albrecht, who also just happens to be the friend I just visited in California. Hi. <laughs> um, although we may have to talk to Renee on the pod um, another time because she is studying conservation biology at University of Santa Barbara, which um, oh. is fucking beautiful. I don't know why we don't live there. But... Um, but yeah, so she has a lot of thoughts about um, environmental regulations and things like that. And she's super, super smart. Um, and it's okay. So her review says, ever tried to get into politics only to feel powerless and more confused? This podcast is the perfect remedy. Not only does Katie explain. Okay, sorry. Also, this is before you join. She doesn't. She's not purposely leaving you out. I'm sure she's a big fan. <laughs> um, Even if she is, it's fine. I understand. Okay. Um, explain the issues in a way that is accessible and entertaining. She also provides easy, actionable steps to get involved and combat those feelings of powerlessness. Each episode leaves me feeling smarter, hopeful, and ready to tackle our, our country's biggest issues. It's a must listen. Isn't that nice? Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, you guys would be friends. I think so. Yeah. Okay, well, I feel better after talking to you. Thanks for, um, thanks for answering my phone call yeah like same honestly i was about ready to eat like half a box of cereal you still could and i wouldn't put i wouldn't blame kept you. me from doing that and now i no longer have that oh. urge all right well you're welcome yeah okay well then i will talk to you we'll catch up next week and see how things are going then all right the only way to go is up yeah dream big fight hard right yeah oh. yeah yeah, dream big, fight hard. That's Elizabeth Warren's campaign slogan. Mm -hmm. We could sign off with that. I'm going to tattoo it on my body. Yeah. You get dream big, I'll get fight hard. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll talk to you next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Make sure you follow along on Instagram at FYMIPod. Shout out to Hope Die for the podcast art and Kyle Dibdahl for the intro and outro music and Ben Schlofelt for the audio production. Please subscribe to this podcast, and if you like it, give us a rating and review. It makes it easier for other people to find us, and the more of us there are, the better. We come out with new episodes every Monday.